This is an episode that was originally made for my patrons on Patreon, part of a monthly series about the History Guys hats that now you get a chance to see this sneak peek on YouTube. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider becoming a patron. This episode lets me talk about a storied regiment and a battle that not only changed the course of a war, but represented a new era for a military whose contributions would prove to be critical during some of the world's darkest hours. It is history that deserves to be remembered. This is a type of cap that's commonly used in the British Army and armies of the British Commonwealth. That's sometimes referred to as a barracks cap or a forage cap because uh, they were originally used for informal duties and also sometimes called a peak cap because this piece here, which Americans would usually call a visor or a brim, the British refer to as a peak. This hat's from the 1980s and actually these hats are going out of style. They're largely being replaced with berets. But one of the things that I like about these regimental caps is that while the designs are fairly similar, different regiments would use different different colors or different piping, and they would all have a different cap badge on the front that represents their regiment. And as the regiments of the British Army and the former Commonwealth usually have long and storied histories, that means that each of these caps and each of these badges represents a unique window into history, and that is certainly true of this particular hat. On this badge is an eight-pointed diamond-cut star, with the star in a raised circle surmounted by a crown, and on the circle are the block letters V-R-I. Those letters are actually called an imperial cipher, which is, in essence, a monogram for a ruling monarch. What is odd about this badge, though, is that the cipher is outdated. A royal or imperial cipher is usually updated for the current monarch, but instead of the cipher for the current monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, VRI stands for Victoria Regina Imperatrix, meaning Victoria, Queen and Empress. So while this hat is from the 1980s, it bears a royal cipher from Queen Victoria, who died in 1901. And that actually tells us all we need to know to know where this hat comes from. Because while there were many regiments who were authorized to use the royal cipher in their badge, there was only one regiment in all of the empire that was authorized to continue to use Victoria's royal cipher in perpetuity. And that unique privilege, surprisingly, didn't go to a regiment of the British Army, but a regiment from one of the Dominions. This hat represents the Royal Canadian Regiment. The Royal Canadian Regiment was formed in 1883 as an infantry school corps designed to train the Canadian militia. And while they have a long and storied history, there is a particular battle and conflict that defined not just the reputation of the Royal Canadian Regiment, but the reputation of the Canadian Army in general. Britain fought numerous wars in the Victorian era as the island nation maintained the largest empire in history and men of Canada serving in British regiments participated in those conflicts throughout the era. But it was at the very end of the Victorian era and the very beginning of the 20th century that Great Britain faced a colonial war so challenging that it required deploying a substantial amount of troops from its dominions outside their own borders. The Second Anglo-Boer War began in 1899 after long-standing tensions between the British and the two Dutch Boer Republics in South Africa culminated in the Boers declaring war. The British government suggested that Canada provide troops for the conflict that would be absorbed into British units. At the time, the Canadian Army, or what was called the Permanent Force, was tiny, and the Royal Canadian Regiment of Infantry was the only infantry regiment of the Permanent Force. A wave of enthusiasm in English Canada allowed for strong recruitment of a force of some 1,000 that had a core of professional troops from the Permanent Force augmented by volunteers. But the Canadian government wanted these troops to have a truly Canadian identity, and so instead of parceling them out to different British units, they were formed into a single battalion that was designated the 2nd Special Service Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment of Infantry. The Second Anglo-Boer War was the first time that Canadians, in Canadian uniforms, fighting in a Canadian unit, made war overseas. The battalion arrived in South Africa on November 29th of 1899 into what had already become a bloody conflict. At the outset, the outnumbered British forces in Natal and Cape Colony were quickly surrounded and besieged, but it had been generally expected that a quickly mobilized army corps under General Redvers Buller would soon overcome the Boers. But the British were using outdated tactics that had been developed in the colonial wars of the past. British generals failed to comprehend the impact of destructive fire from trench positions and the mobility of cavalry raids. The day before the Canadian battalion had arrived, the British had won a nominal victory, forcing the Boers to withdraw at the Battle of Modder River. While the British had managed to flank the Boers and force them to withdraw, the British had learned a brutal lesson in what the forces commander called one of the hardest and most trying fights in the annals of the British Army, 
after the British troops spent much of their time pinned to the ground, tortured by heat and thirst, unable to move as there was no cover from the Boers' deadly accurate fire. It was clear that the tactic of frontal attack by infantry only, that had succeeded so often against colonial opponents, was effectively impossible against an entrenched army using bolt-action rifles. It was a lesson that the British were slow to learn. As the Canadian battalion spent a couple of months on line of communication duties, which was a critical time for the Canadians to train since they were largely inexperienced, the British Army suffered a string of devastating defeats at the hands of the Boer commandos. Between December 10th and 15th, the Boers had won three lopsided and bloody victories against Buller's armies at the battles of Stormberg, Magersfontein, and Colenso. British losses had been so terrible that British press called the brutal time the Black Week. On February 12, 1900, the men of the Royal Canadian Regiment of Infantry joined the 19th Brigade as part of a large British offensive intended to capture Pretoria, the capital of the Boer state of Transvaal. Six days later, the Canadians would experience the full terror of what some have called the First Modern War at the Battle of Partaberg. The new invasion force threatened the flank of a Boer force under the command of Piet Cronje that had won the victory at the Battle of Magersfontein in December. Cronje's force of some 4,500 Boers, hampered by a slow-moving supply train, was trying to withdraw when it was blocked at a crossing of the Modder River by British cavalry, allowing a 15,000-man force under the command of Lieutenant General Horatio Kitchener to surround them. The Boers entrenched themselves at a place called Partaberg, which in the Boer Afrikaans language means Horse Hill. The situation was dire for Cronje, as the British had overwhelming artillery and could bombard his commando into submission. But Kitchener, who had gained fame fighting dervishes in the modest wars, and whom had been worried about Boer reinforcements, instead ordered frontal attacks on Cronje's prepared position, despite the lessons from the failure of those tactics in December. The attacks occurred on Sunday, February 18, 1900. One of the two regiments to lead those attacks were the Royal Canadians. The position was terrible. The Canadian troops, exhausted already from a long march, first had to make a difficult crossing of the Modder River. As one private noted, we had quite a time crossing as the water was up to our chins and the current very strong. Once across, they formed for the attack. The land sloped down to the Boer position for over 800 yards with no cover. The Boers opened a devastating fire at about a hundred yards. The attack was stymied and the troops that weren't immediately killed were pinned down by fire until they could retreat under the cover of night. Kitchener's force took over 1,100 casualties that day, the single greatest loss of life for Imperial forces in the Second Boer War. 78 of the killed and wounded were from the Royal Canadians. That day became known as Bloody Sunday. For eight days, the British shelled the Boer position. While this caused few casualties among the entrenched Boer fighters, it destroyed their wagons and killed their horses and mules. Cronje's Boers were becoming increasingly demoralized. But it was the Canadians who would break the stalemate. The Royal Canadians were ordered to another assault on February 27th, again taking terrible losses. But instead of withdrawing in the night as before, with the help of the Royal Engineers, they dug trench lines that night less than 65 yards from the Boer positions. In the morning, the Boers found themselves looking down the barrels of the rifles of the entrenched Canadians. Realizing that his position was hopeless, Cronje surrendered. It was the first significant British victory and a clear turning point in the Second Anglo-Boer War. The 4,000 or so Boers that were taken into captivity represented nearly 10% of the Boer army, and the victory played huge role in the morale of both armies and the eventual defeat of the Boer armies in the field. But it was also a turning point for the Canadians, who received a great deal of the credit for the victory. Field Marshal Lord Roberts, the commander of British forces in South Africa, said of the Canadians, They were as good a lot of men as were in the British Army. Canadian now stands for bravery, dash, and courage. Major General Sir Horace Smith Dorian said of the Canadians, There are no finer troops or more gallant troops in all the world. The victory changed the British and the world's perception of Canada, as Canadian Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier said before the House of Commons of the victory of Paardeberg, that day the fact had been revealed to the world that a new power had arisen in the West. From 1901 to 1914, Canadians would gather in town squares and around memorials on February 27th to celebrate Paardeberg Day, which was a, a day to celebrate the Canadian Army's first major victory in an overseas war, to recognize those Canadians who had served in the Second Anglo-Boer War, and as an affirmation of English Canada's loyalty to the Empire. 
Those celebrations largely ended with the coming of the Great War and have been replaced with Remembrance Day, which is solemnly celebrated on November 11th, representing the date of the armistice in that war. From that first deployment of a truly Canadian unit, the Canadian Army has gone on to play vital and gallant roles in some of the most important and bloody conflicts in world history, through the World Wars, the Korean Conflict, the Gulf War, and into UN peacekeeping operations in the war in Afghanistan in the 21st century. Approximately 118,000 Canadians have lost their lives in overseas wars. Today, the Royal Canadian Regiment is the senior regular force infantry regiment in the Canadian Army, still ready to fight to defend Canada and Canada's vital interests. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.